The development system of the space launch system and the Orion crew vehicle are major milestones for our nation's space program, and I would not understate their importance. However, I would like to address the larger view related to the current state of our human spaceflight program and comment on its progress and direction. The idea of what is possible in space has been in transition over the last decade. When talking with the public, I use a model to describe the ecosystem that is today's human spaceflight program. I refer you to the figure on the TV monitors and have you imagine a bubble or a balloon centered on the Earth slowly expanding. That expanding surface represents the outward expansion of human activity. Since, since the Apollo era, for the last 40 years, the surface of that bubble has been expanded only to low Earth orbit in that initial phase, and it's remained there. During this period, the government was the driving force behind the expansion of human activity in space, and this has led to an accumulation of experience, technology, and management operations in, in this environment. Now private industry has become interested in engaging more proactively and independently in this open space, in that development phase as on the figure. As commercial activities mature, it creates stability and a foundation upon which the surface of the bubble, the initial phase, can expand yet further beyond low Earth orbit. For the foreseeable future, expansion beyond will continue to be driven primarily by government-derived goals and investments. Because of the increase in engagement by industry in LEO in low Earth orbit, NASA and the government are now free to develop beyond into cislunar space and beyond that. But at the core of implementing this model are two key questions. What are the technologies, knowledge, and experience that the government wants to have available for broad dissemination to industry 50 years from now? And two, what are the capabilities and services that, are, that the government and private industry, each driven by their own motives, are interested in developing that can potentially sustain viable space-based businesses after leveraging initial government investment. A core concept inherent in the model and underscored by these questions is the fact that there is a need for government investment and activity at the leading edge of exploration during that initial phase. And the fact that industry will sooner or later reap the benefit of that government investment to create and establish new capabilities and business ventures in the development phase. And I might comment the normalization phase we're not ready for yet in human space flight, but you see that happening uh, over the last decades in the satellite industry where there are independent economic spheres active and the government is a customer. However, the government still does its own thing for its own purposes. So if you can add that uh, sort of with a twist to human space flight, we're just simply not ready for that phase yet. And this is the dynamic that's unfolding in human spaceflight, as I mentioned. The model I've discussed is a powerful one, and if it's employed strategically, if employed strategically, if, and that brings me to the important point, and this is one that you've heard many, many times, and I don't think that you disagree, and so the United States needs a comprehensive national space strategy. It is imperative that we commit as a nation with a constancy of purpose for the long term. It is the nature of the space business that it takes time, patience, and constant purpose to make advancements. The establishment of the National Space Council provides an opportunity to create this integrated approach. A committed long-term strategy is necessary, but it's not enough to ensure the success of the U.S. space program. To be effective, sufficient resources need to be allocated to implement the plan. This is something that has challenged NASA in the past and continues today. When I joined the agency in 1996, NASA received approximately seven-tenths of a penny for every tax dollar. Today, the agency receives approximately five-tenths of a penny for every tax dollar. This despite the fact that the number, breadth, and complexity of programs has increased. Fundamentally, NASA is constrained by limited control on the expense side of its budget as well, and has limited freedom to adjust overhead, either facilities or civil workforce, whether size or skill set, and in some cases, the management of task assignments around the agency. To execute a long-term strategic U.S. space program in a constrained budget environment effectively and successively, NASA must be given the ability to make decisions and take actions in these areas. Equally important to the adequate resources is the stability and assurance of those resources. Developing space hardware is complex and challenging, as you've heard today. A program with a multi-year phase budget can absorb more initially expensive engineering decisions knowing that the result will be lower operational cost and hence overall net savings over the life of the program. The current budgeting process and lack of a stable budgetary environment prohibits this kind of comprehensive approach to be used. The transition that is occurring in how humans engage in space has been a goal for decades. Our nation was built upon exploration, expansion, and ex economic development. From the arrival of the first immigrants and settlers to the westward expansion, across the continent we have faced the challenges, forged new paths, and overcome all obstacles. As we expand into space, the next frontier, I am confident we can tap into the same spirit and energy. Again, thank you for the opportunity to address this body 
and thank you for your continued support of our nation's space program. I look forward to answering any questions you may have.